um, with which I can assure you that the civil service and ministers are already well engaged and we look forward to that being a positive inquiry. Sir Bob Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Bernard. Uh, Prime Minister, um, I was tempted to say I'm opening the bowling, but maybe that's not the appropriate uh, <laughs> start, start, start for today. Uh, but I wanted to refer to the inquiry that the Liaison Committee has set up, because we attempt, after all, to coordinate the activity of all the select committees. Uh, and the purpose of the inquiry is to look at the way government seeks to coordinate policy uh, and uh, decisions and action across government departments. Do you recognise that there is a problem with the UK government activities being very siloed? Well, I, mean, I think that has historically been a concern yeah. of government. I mean, I saw that as Chancellor, actually, most, yeah. uh, probably most acutely when I was doing spending reviews, where obviously departments would focus on the things that were most important to them. And some of those areas that required departments to work together to put in bids yeah. were probably less developed than you might like. Actually, uh, the early years being uh, an obvious example of that. So, I mean, I certainly, I can certainly see why the perception is there. And as I said, I've seen the developments of that as, as Chancellor. C can I draw the position of the Ministry of Justice to your attention mm. as an example of this? As a department whose funding is, is not protected uh, in financial terms, uh, but uh, which is frequently uh, under pressure because of failures in other parts of the system. For example, people end up in the justice system because they've uh, had chaotic lifestyles, families have broken up, they've been failed by social services, they've been failed at school, they've been failed uh, by um, uh, drug testing programmes. What is the means by, whereby government can take into account uh, the pressures that are placed upon that downstream department which is the recipient of the failures elsewhere. Is there a mechanism to recognise that and to join up policy across those areas? Yes, so actually when I was Chancellor, we established something called the Shared Outcomes Fund, which uh, funded departments to do exactly this, to work together, particularly where they could tackle some of the problems that need upstream or downstream, depending on your perspective, intervention. Uh, as in early years as one I mentioned, where actually the, the Supporting Families Programme, what used to be called the Troubled Families Programme, is a good example of that, where work was done to evaluate the benefit of that programme on outcomes in education or the criminal justice system so that government overall could understand the value of that programme. It shouldn't just be a, something that MHCLG or DLUC should be concerned with because actually all these departments were benefiting one way or another from that programme. So that, that's the type of thinking that I try to introduce as, as Chancellor and I think that programme is a good example uh, where there was clear evidence that it was having an impact beneficially on criminal justice outcomes. Two quick examples. I mean, the, the Home Office is recruiting 20,000 extra police officers, that's government policy. What uh, steps are being taken to properly fund the Ministry of Justice for the extra court time that will be taken up by hopefully those police officers capturing more uh, offenders and potential prison time? Because at the moment they are not covered to pick up the costs of those extra police officers doing their job. So. I mean, actually, my recollection, because I was Chancellor at the time that the funding for that was put in place, was that the downstream impact of the 20,000 police officers were calculated <coughs> and funded as part of the original settlement for all those departments to deliver on the 20,000 police officers' commitment. Uh, I, that was I was Chancellor at the time, and I distinctly remember those conversations of that modelling happening with particular focus on the downstream cost, because you're absolutely right. We can't just focus on the cost of police officers. Obviously, that has a knock-on impact elsewhere. But my, my recollection is uh, that was funded as part of the settlement at the time for the 20,000 police officers uplift program. To try and uh, join up matters, at least within the criminal justice world, um, there was something called the Criminal Justice Board that was established back in 2015. It hasn't actually met since 2021, but it still appears in existence on the government website. I've uh, got an excellent Lord Chancellor. Could you perhaps assist him to get that <laughs> Criminal Justice Board up and operating again because there's a real concern of a lack of join-up uh, across this sector, this sector? So I'm very happy to make sure that the join-up is happening. And actually, I, for example, on tackling uh, illegal migration, that's something where I regularly convene different departments, particularly Home Office and Ministry of Justice, because it requires, a, and indeed actually DLUC and, and others, because it requires a cross-government uh, coordination to deliver on the priorities uh, and I'm ha I'll happily look at 
making sure that we are coordinated and joined up. I'm not sure what the exact right structure is sitting here, but I very much am sympathetic to the thrust of the question. Just a potential cost savings, if we can get it right. And, and again, which is to the benefit of the individuals and indeed the taxpayer, yes. where we can realise those. And the final point I was going to raise to Bernard very quickly uh, is this. You've recognised in the past, Prime Minister, the importance of the reputation of the English legal system for the United Kingdom standing in the world. Um, in October, England and Wales will have its first uh, woman, Chief Justice. Um, will you make a point uh, of making uh, an early opportunity to meet with Dame Sue Carr uh, when she takes up her appointment so that you can learn from her first hand the real pressures that there are on the courts? Because delays of two years or so for a small business to have a, a money claim that can make all the difference to its survival heard in the county courts, for example, are really not acceptable or fair. Would you agree? Yeah, so I've actually met already with the previous Excellent. Lord Chief Justice uh, I think a couple of different times since yes. I've been Prime Minister and I fully expect that I will continue those meetings and engagement with the new Lord Chief Justice uh, and we are focused very hard on reducing the court backlog. Uh, obviously more funding has gone into it uh, as the committee will be aware uh, but also we've removed the limit on sitting days in the Crown Court uh, we've continued to use the, I believe, 16 Nightingale, Nightingale courtrooms, uh, and actually we raise a statutory retirement age for judicial office holders, all of which are initiatives that help expand judicial uh, capacity to help us get through the, the backlogs. But it remains a commitment and a focus of ours, but I look forward to discussing that uh, with the new Lord Chief Justice in due course. Thank um, you very much. Thank you, Sir Bob. We're now moving on to the all-important subject of the Russian aggression in Ukraine and other associated security issues with Alicia Cairns, Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Prime Minister, I fear that we are on the cusp of the Gaza crisis of 2023. Yesterday, we took up a uh, presidency of the UN Security Council. How do you hope that over this month we will use that to shed a light on what is taking place, but also what outcomes will we achieve during our presidency? So what were you referring in specifically to, Alicia? So the Gaza crisis, so essentially Israel-Palestine, but also as President of the UN Security Council the next month, what have you tasked Foreign Office civil servants to achieve? Well, I think well, there's a couple of different things. You know, obviously, with regard to the current situation in Israel and, and around, of course we support Israel's right to self-defense and have condemned the recent terrorist attacks. We would say that the protection of civilians must be prioritized in any military operation and would urge the IDF to demonstrate restraint in its operation and for all parties to avoid further escalation in both the West Bank and Gaza, both now and in, in the days ahead, um, and also call on Israel to adhere to principles of necessity and proportionality when defending their legitimate security interests. That more broadly, with regard to the UN Security Council uh, and our actions there, I, I would imagine that we will continue to focus on highlighting what's happening in Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, Russia's illegal invasion, I think one thing that we have uh, helped, I think, play a leading role in is ensuring broad support of the UN condemning Russian action. Over 140 different countries have signed the resolutions that we have uh, helped to support in the UN, uh, and that will continue, I would imagine, to be a focus um, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, and I think uh, recent events in Russia you know, highlight um, from others the illegality of Russia's invasion and I think hopefully other countries are recognising that and will continue to use the UN as a, a platform to highlight that. So uh, just before we move on to Ukraine, in your discussions with Netanyahu, how clear were we that we should not see an expansion of illegal settlements and will we see Israel-Palestine brought forward specifically by the British government then over the next month? So uh, settlements are illegal under international law, and we've said that they present an obstacle to peace and threaten the physical viability of a two-state solution. Uh, now, we've consistently engaged with Israel, and obviously I met President Netanyahu uh, a little while ago, uh, and we've repeatedly made clear to Israel that we oppose any settlement expansion, and we've asked the Israeli government to halt and reverse its policy. Um, and moving then to Ukraine, there are reports that ahead of the Vilnius summit, uh, I guess a coalition of the willing will bring forward some sort of security uh, support package, a security agreement for Ukraine. Can you set out for me what your vision would be for such a security agreement for Ukraine? Well, not, not wanting to preempt the conversations that are obviously happening in private, what I have said is that I think it would be beneficial for Ukraine and for the conflict for there to be a, a multilateral 
declaration of support for Ukraine into the long into the long term. Um, there are various different shapes and forms that can take. Those conversations are happening. The purpose of that declaration, assuming it can be something that gathers broad support, is to demonstrate that support for Ukraine will be in place for the long term. I think that will send a strong signal to Putin that his efforts um, are, are in vain. And ultimately, he should recognize that we, the coalition of the willing to, who are defending principles of territorial integrity and the UN Charter, are not going to go away and will continue to give Ukraine the support it needs and the means to defend itself against current and future aggression. But so those conversations are, are ongoing. And what's your level of confidence that Vilnius, we will see a path to NATO membership for Ukraine set out and agreed? Again, those, uh, those conversations are ongoing. As you all know, uh, NATO is a consensus organisation. Uh, and so we're having those conversations with our partners. You know, what's very clear, I've said previously in the past that Ukraine's rightful place is in NATO, but the alliance works by consensus, so we will have to work together with our allies. Uh, but there are things that we are already doing that will help Ukraine on that journey, notably the increasing the interoperability of capabilities, the training of Ukrainian troops to, to NATO standards, um, and the provision of NATO standard equipment. All of all are examples of that type of support that will help Ukraine, not just now, but um, on that longer term journey as well. Thank you. Moving us uh, to the Balkans, there has been an international failure of deterrence when it comes to the Western Balkans. I think that's best exemplified by the EU and US response and recent punishments of Kosovo in the face of Serb antagonism and Dodic secessionist rhetorics in Bosnia and Herzegovina. As Prime Minister, will you now commit that we will rejoin U4, which I'd add that both Turkey and Chile are members of? Um, and will you also consider lobbying for an expansion of K4's mandate in Kosovo so that they can deal with the illegal arms being brought across from Serbia into Kosovo, um, which are arming uh, illegal uh, Belgrade-funded and armed militias in Kosovo? The well, first thing to say is we in the government fully support Bosnia and Herzegovina's territorial integrity and sovereignty, and we'll continue to take measures against those who threaten that. Uh, we're particularly concerned, I'm particularly concerned about the situation in the north of Kosovo, which you'll be familiar with, and very much condemn the unprovoked attacks by, by protesters on K4 personnel. Uh, the Foreign Secretary has already told the Prime Ministers of both <coughs> Kosovo and Serbia that, uh, that leaders in Belgrade and Pristina do have a responsibility to reduce tension and prevent further violence. Our view is we must find a way back to the EU facilitated dialogue. Uh, with regard to U4, we do see U4 as uh, U4 as um, vital for peace and security in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And our non-participation in it doesn't reflect the importance of the operation to the peace and stability of the region. And we're going to continue to explore opportunities to widen cooperation with the mission. Thank you. I would urge the government to look very closely at that and then very finally, very briefly, just taking back to Israel-Palestine, just a yes or no answer. Okay. Um, would you now put in place a special envoy for the Middle East peace process to make sure we have the adequate attention on what's going on there? I, I think, look, it's something that I you know, I know my, the FCDO are talking to the Honourable Lady about and happy to continue talking to her about. We continue to say that's something that we'll be open to at a time that we think it will be beneficial to the peace process. So it's not that we're against it in principle, it's just figuring out when it can I'm be I'm going to deployed. take that as a yes, but subject to announcement, hopefully. Oh, thank you very much. Thank um, you, Chair. Prime Minister, I'm not using my time uh, in this session for the benefit of others, but two supplementaries very briefly. We're confronting Russian aggression in Ukraine very vociferously and very clearly. How confident are you that the international community is not appeasing proxy Russian aggression in the Balkans? Uh, I don't. I don't believe. I don't believe that we are. And as I've heard from my answers to the um, to Alicia, we're continuing to take quite a robust stance against proxies, not just in that region, but you know, previously in, in uh, Africa as well with Wagner, because you know, where we see threats to territorial integrity and sovereignty, I think it's important that we do our best to stand up for them, and that, that's what we're doing. The, the war in Ukraine will last as long as uh, the friends of democracy around the world allow it to last. The more support we can give, the quicker it will end successfully for the Ukrainians. Are we doing enough and what more could we be doing? 
Well, we've, uh, I think as everybody knows, uh, provided 2.3 or are providing 2.3 billion pounds in military support for Ukraine this year, matching what we've given last year, which uh, yeah, I believe puts us second only to the Americans. Uh, but I think it's more, you know, as well as just the quantum of support, it's a type of support where we have been consistently out in front in the type of capability that we are providing to the Ukrainians and training them on. That, you saw that with main battle tanks, which uh, I was the first uh, lead to announce we would provide and actually provide. And then most recently with Storm Shadow long range weapons, which are having a beneficial impact <coughs> on the current uh, on the current uh, state of the conflict. And uh, we will continue to do that and look for opportunities to provide Ukrainians with the support they need. The priority remains as it always has been, you know, heavy armor, artillery, long range weapons uh, and training, most recently combat air, where we will play our part as part of an international coalition to provide um, combat capabilities, particularly training of pilots. Uh, and we're starting that this summer, uh, in fact, which is something that I know the Ukrainians have, have warmly welcomed. And we continue to talk to other countries about increasing their support for Ukraine, both in quantum and in capability. And I think that is important at this stage because the priority is to ensure that the counteroffensive can be as successful as we would all like it to be. Thank you, Prime Minister. Greg Clark on science and technology and AI. Uh, thank you, Sir Bernard. Uh, good afternoon, Prime Minister. Uh, Prime Minister, a few days ago you told uh, London Tech Week that the possibilities of AI are extraordinary. Um, what do you see as the biggest positive impact of artificial intelligence? Well, I think just in the last few weeks in the news reporting, you know, you've seen some of the promise of AI, paralysed people being able to walk, the, the uh, kind of cracking of the structure of almost every known protein, and you know, starting to get a model reactions in nuclear fusion. So it just gives you a sense of the variety um, that is there. And also when you combine that with the computational power of quantum, I think you can really start to imagine a future in which even incurable diseases like cancer and uh, dementia or new ways to grow crops all might be possible. I, look, for me, I, I'd kind of put it in a couple of different categories. I think straightforwardly on the economy side, an interesting report from PwC recently that estimated a 10% kind of GDP benefit over the coming decade. Um, you're starting to see that in the way that companies are using AI and indeed leading companies like Palantir opening their European AI HQ here and, uh, and the quality of our research, etc. So that's on the economic side. Of, uh, you know, I've spoken in the past about AI holding out the promise of being a general purpose technology and the economic research is it's very clear that that leads to a kind of J-curve effect in productivity that we are on the cusp of hopefully realising. And then in public services, I'd say health and education are the two areas where you know, I'm excited, particularly in healthcare. I think reasonably people are reasonably familiar with the opportunity to speed up diagnosis of a range of different conditions, uh, but also improve the productivity and accuracy of, for example, people looking for skin cancers. Is interesting. Derm AI technology that is being deployed, or robotic surgery, and then in education, the opportunity to reduce workload for teachers, whether it's lesson planning or, or marking, but then also provide personalised tuition for children. Uh, the Khan Academy is starting to roll out an AI chatbot, which has, um, I think, enormous potential, because we know that that more personalised approach to learning has huge benefits for children, particularly disadvantaged children. And tutoring in the physical sense is hard to scale, but the technology allows us to provide that, and I think that would be transformational. Absolutely. So lots of upsides. But in, in that speech to London Tech Week, you said that uh, we must do AI safely. So what do you see as the biggest danger of AI? So I would categorise the risks into a few different buckets. I think first it, you know, is the socioeconomic risk from the large-scale societal shifts that the technology will bring. That's often what technology does. That doesn't mean you should stand in the way of it, but it just needs to make sure that we're cognizant of it and provide people with the skills they need to flourish in a world that is being changed by technology. I think the second is the risk of misuse, um, and that is whether it's open source models or otherwise, you know, the ability that they, well, they can be used as tools to generate misinformation or identify and exploit cyber vulnerabilities or create harmful content or deep fakes or child sexual abuse, that's the kind of second category. Uh, I think the third category would be tool use, 
whereby foundation models that can be used to activate capabilities in the real world. And then the last category is what people would describe as capability overhangs. Uh, and that kind of trends into the area of more existential risk because there's just a, you know, a lack of understanding at this point about what the potential of these models might be. Now, obviously, separate to all of that, there are national security risks, which I'm sure the Honourable Gentleman acknowledge. I appreciate and limited what I can say. But I think thinking about it in those four categories is probably the right way to, to go about it. Thank you. And you've convened an international safety summit uh, for the autumn. <laughs> Are you intending that to be a summit of like-minded countries, like the US and Japan, perhaps? Or is it for all countries, a bit like the International Atomic Energy Authority that includes uh, countries like China and Russia? Which, what do you have in mind? I, I think, look, it, I think in the first instance, mainly what we're trying to do is acknowledge that there is a global dimension to this challenge. And AI doesn't respect national borders. Countries are at varying stages of their thinking about how we can put guardrails in place to make sure that we can realize the benefits of AI in a way that is safe and secure. And it seems a sensible and reasonable step to just try and bring some of those countries together to talk about these problems uh, you know, in a collective forum, because ultimately there will need to be some coordination. Sure. So I think it's, it's quite early thinking, as I said, it's more just about bringing people together. So who all are countries who, together. Well, uh, it's just bringing people together who are thinking about these things in a, in a similar way, uh, to, to exchange ideas, share information, um, as I said, because AI doesn't respect national borders, and I think we will all benefit from hearing and talking to each other uh, in a conversation with the businesses themselves. Um, and I think that, that that is really what this is about. I think we're not we're you know, a long way from anyone establishing a yeah, AIA, IAA equivalent for AI. Those things are you know long into the distance. But in the first instance, just talking through this with like-minded countries and seems a sensible Finally, from that, uh, Prime Minister, so, uh, you've got the summit, uh, you published a white paper in March. Um, the, the, the last session of this parliament begins in November. Uh, will there be, do you expect there to be a, an AI bill in the King's speech? Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to comment now on fourth session legislation. All those conversations are, are happening and no final decisions are being made. I, I think actually what we need to do, and I think probably we can do lots of this without legislation, is sitting down and figuring out what are the safety features and guardrails that we'd like to put in place. And uh, I think we have a sense of what some of those might be, whether it's watermarking, whether it's uh, pre-release information sharing, whether it's reporting and licensing of large training runs. Um, whether it's pre-training or pre-deployment disclosure, transparency on the data sets that are used. I think that's the kind of category of things that we need to do spend time on, which is why the Foundation Model Task Force has been set up and funded specifically in its early phase to focus on safety research. I think it's an area where the UK can lead because we already have good capability in it. So if we can develop that um, capability further, because it's a growing field, you know, it will it will mean that we will know what to do. And it may well be, and actually so far, the conversations with the three leading foundation model companies have been incredibly cooperative. But they're calling for legislation. Uh, actually, well, I, I think what they want are for governments to put in place the, the, uh, the guardrails. And they're very open about that. And they're very, I say thus far, they have been incredibly constructive and open and transparent with government. Uh, and want to try and find a, a solution together, which, as I said, it's too early to preempt what all that might look like, but you can imagine a world where at least the initial stages of that don't require legislation necessarily, um, but actually just require us to get in there and do safety evaluation on the models and have access to them. And um, you know, as I said, we've had announcements already from some of those foundation model companies that they will provide um, that access to the government to be able to do that on a, uh, on a priority basis, which I'm grateful for and I think will help us get this right. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I'm sorry, we're, we're dragging behind. People are going to have to be quicker and I'll have to be stricter. Uh, Dame Diana Johnson, Home Affairs. Thank you. Good afternoon, Minister. I know you're appealing the Court of Appeals ruling on the uh, Rwanda scheme. You've said this policy is an important part of your plan to tackle illegal migration and stop small boats. So do you have a plan for what you'll do if the appeal fails? Uh, I, as I said, our belief uh, remains that the, the plan that we have is legal, it's compliant with all our obligations. 
and will be appealing it vigorously. And uh, you know, what if you look at the ruling, what you'll see is the Lord Chief Justice, in his opinion, agreed with the High Court and with the government that the safeguards that, and reassurances that we have received from Rwanda are sufficient. Uh, there's a very specific point of contention about the onward relocation, potentially, of people who we send to Rwanda. And so we believe that the safeguards we have are sufficient, so we'll continue okay. to confidently and vigorously pursue our case. So you're betting everything on the Rwanda policy being upheld in the in the Supreme Court? Well, no, that's not, I think that's, that's not a fair characterisation of what we're doing. Well, it's I mean, a gamble, not, isn't it? You're not not sure. Last year and indeed this year, I set out a range of things that we're doing to tackle this problem. Yes. So, for example... Can I come on to that? Because I've got some specific questions of what well, you're I'm going just, to say. I'm just, well, well, just ask because you asked, asked the question. It, is, it could be a very substantive additional piece is the new deal that we have with Albania. Yeah, can Albania I... Could, with great respect, Prime Minister, I've got very little time and I do want to get through some important issues with you. So if I could just leave that... I've, I've got your... But I think your, you, you made a statement that we're betting the house on one thing. I think it's reasonable for me to say, well, let me give you an example of something else that is significant that is making a difference with the to the problem. Respect, Dame, Dame Diana. With the great respect, Prime Minister, I've got quite a few questions I want to ask. So you, you're clear that you think Rwanda's going to succeed in the Supreme Court. Just on the small boats issue, um, I think it's six months today since you made your five promises to the British people, including stopping the small boats. Now, win or lose in the court of the P, uh, in the Supreme Court, right now your plans around Rwanda are on hold. So, does that mean your uh, attempt to stop the small boats that's on hold at the moment? No, and a good example of why it's not on hold is our deal with Albania. Albania accounted for a third of the legal migrants that crossed last year. We looked at, and that is surprising given that Albania is clearly a safe country and it's an ally of the European nation uh, and it's a signatory to many of the same treaties that we are on these issues, uh, which is why our new deal with Albania okay. and a revision in, in how we treat Could, illegal migrants from Albania means... I know you're very keen to talk about Albania, but I, I'm well, very keen to well, actually just, address the fact that in June... Well, so it's the actually given, month, it's a, it's a, you asked for an example of being committed to continuing to stop the boats outside of the Rwanda policy. This is a very accept, good example of something that, yeah. as I said, we've returned almost 2,000 illegal migrants. But none migrants. from actually who came across last year. None of the returns actually relate to people who travelled in small boats last year, do they? Uh, because we work through the backlog of people we've got. But because of the New Deal, we are now able to return people to Albania. And you can start to see the early benefit of that deterrence because you know, okay. the, in the, the so, most recent data that we had, the number okay. of illegal migrants from Albania had reduced right. considerably so could, since we, we put that new Albania. deal on place. So okay, let's move on from it Albania. It shows that you can make a difference the, the on this policy. The largest number of people who crossed uh, the Channel in small boats last year, the largest number in any of the records that have been kept uh, over the last five years, 3,824. The majority come, or a large chunk, come from Afghanistan. So uh, what I'm just trying to get to is with the rate of progress that you're making at the moment, when do you think you'll be able to fulfil your pledge to stop the small boats? Uh, so obviously the, the court will have to determine its own ruling and that is outside of the government's hands. It's the court that determines the timing of its okay. rulings. But in the meantime, we can get on with a range of other things, as I said. Uh, okay. We've talked uh, about the deal in Albania. The other thing, yeah, one of the other things we're doing. You've talked about the deal in Albania is, quite a lot. I'm well, quite, well, actually, we'll move on to one of the other things we're doing is tackling small... illegal, illegal working to show people that if they do okay. come here illegally, can, they won't be able to disappear I... into the black economy. Okay. So one of the things we've done is increase the number of illegal working raids by right. about 50%. Can I just ask you some questions that relate... And again, all of that will contribute, I believe, to a deterrent effect. Okay. With the great respect, Prime Minister, I want to ask you this. The Illegal Migration Bill, which was introduced uh, earlier this year, since that in the bill was introduced, 8,128 people have crossed the channel in small boats. So if we assume your Rwanda policy is upheld in the, in the Supreme Court, uh, Rwanda has said they can take a capacity of 500 people. So that leaves 7,628 who've come across since the bill was introduced. What do you intend will happen to those people? As I said, I'm, I'm not going to talk about a 
private commercial contract that we have, but our okay. Rwanda scheme, as we have said multiple times, is uncapped. Okay. So I think it's that is important. It's not what the Rwandans say, well, the, is it? Well, the, the Rwanda scheme is uncapped, okay. and uh, which is why I believe can, it can act as a very helpful okay. deterrent can, when the scheme is up and running. Can I move on to your other promise, which is around dealing with the backlog? And when you came last time, you said you were going to double the workforce, triple productivity, and re-engineer the system. <coughs> Uh, to deal with the backlog, the legacy backlog. Yet the National Audit Office has found the Home Office is not yet making enough decisions to actually achieve your target of clearing that part of the backlog by December 23. So I just wondered what's, what's going wrong? Because you were very chipper last time about how you were going to deliver this. Yes, so I think when I made the announcement, uh, the uh, legacy initial asylum backlog was around 92,000. Uh, when I gave the update earlier this year, that had reduced by almost a fifth, by about 17,000 down to around 74,000. So that is the progress that has already been made in reducing the legacy initial asylum backlog. Um, and I said that those numbers were when I last gave the update, but they were down by around a fifth. So you'll deliver by oh, December? Yeah. Your time's up. Okay. Sorry. Uh, moving on to the cost of living crisis, uh, Harriet Baldwin for the Treasury Committee. Thank you very much, Sir Bernard. Now, Prime Minister, we're halfway through the year and you want to halve inflation this year. And how is that going? What probability would you assign to you achieving that by the end of the year? Well, I'll leave, leave that to the forecasters, but we remain committed to bringing inflation down. Uh, and halfway is a step on it going back down to the inflation target, which is obviously even lower than that. And now it's clearly that inflation proving um, more persistent than people anticipated, but that doesn't mean that the plans and the policy options that have been deployed are the wrong ones, indeed they're the right ones, um, whether that's monetary policy, responsible fiscal policy or supply side reform, you know, that's the right toolkit uh, that you need to deploy bringing inflation down. Uh, we just need to continue to stick to the course, and that's not easy. Uh, that involves difficult decisions, but those are the right long-term decisions for the country because if we don't do that, inflation will just get worse and last for longer, and that doesn't help anybody. You've mentioned forecasts, and the Bank of England, the Chair of Court, has actually written to the Treasury Committee to say that they're going to do a root and branch review of their inflation forecasting models because they have been wrong. So what percentage would you put on achieving your goal of I, that, I, I, don't, I don't have one for you. I'm working 100% to, to deliver it and we will keep doing that. That's all I can do is just keep throwing everything at it. And as I said, the broad mix of policy levers we have are the monetary policy, which is independent <coughs> of government, fiscal policy, which is in our control and supply side reform. Um, those are the two levers that we have that we will make sure that we use fully and I think everyone can see that this is incredibly important and it's important that we tackle it because that's ultimately uh, what is making people poorer. It's eating into the money in their pockets and that's why de de uh, defeating inflation is such a central uh, premise and plank of our economic strategy. Do you accept that there's a higher probability as of today that you will miss that target than there was at the beginning of the year? I, don't know. I think there's a, there's a range of forecasts, but I don't spend my time on that. I, I can't control. What I can control is what we're doing. And what I can tell you is we remain committed to bringing inflation down and using all the tools at our disposal to keep working to bring inflation down. Right? That's what I should focus on. And you know, that's what the government is going to continue to do. And given that the Bank of England have accepted they need to look again at their inflation models, do you have confidence in the approach that they're taking to bring inflation down? Yes, of course I support the, the Bank of England. I mean, look, their modelling is a, is a matter for them. and It's right that you know, they're having that dialogue and, and uh, evaluating everything that they do. But you know, of course I support the Bank of England. Their track, the track record of the independent central bank over the past 20, 25 years at keeping inflation to target has, has been very strong. Um, I don't think anyone thinks we should return to a world um, where the government is setting interest rates. Uh, so I think it is right that they're set independently. Again, it's not easy that we bring, uh, there are no decisions that are easy when it comes to bringing inflation down, but we have to do the things that are right for the long-term benefit of the country. You're confident that the tools that they're using are the right one because obviously they keep raising bank rate 
and that's affecting mortgage payers in particular. Um, and actually a small cohort of mortgage payers who are either on a variable or whose fixed rates are coming to an end. So it's a really small subset of the population that are having to do the heavy lifting in terms of reducing demand through this monetary policy tool. Is there nothing that could be done that might sort of widen uh, the, the fiscal pain, as it were, that would uh, make it less of a problem that the Bank of England could only solve through raising rates much more sharply than they had anticipated. So again, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be right for me to comment on monetary policy, but there are lots of different transmission mechanisms for how monetary policy feeds into the real economy. Obviously, mortgage rates are one, but you know, there are other ways as well. Uh, you're right about the transmission mechanism being perhaps slower when it comes to mortgages than it has been in the past because of the preponderance of people to have at least short-term fixed rate mortgages now, but that's something that the bank take into account in their modelling. Um, but I say that the mortgage aspect of it is just one of the many transmission mechanisms of the monetary policy. What else can we do? Well, that's what I talked earlier about fiscal policy and supply side reform. So fiscal policy is making sure that our borrowing is responsible, our approach to public sector pay is responsible. If we get those things wrong, that makes the inflation situation worse. And with supply side reform, it's about making sure that we are increasing the supply of, uh, of areas of the economy where you know we are short you know, it's fundamentally leading to some of the inflationary pressures so whether that's in energy labor markets or elsewhere I think we should target our policy there and look of course I acknowledge the um, the difficulty that rising interest rates pose for mortgage holders and, and um, may I just uh, use my last which is half the, minute to uh, ask uh, about very, savers very, yeah. uh, and well, the transmission you, mechanism of them being paid more by the banks um, do you endorse the campaign that the Treasury Committee's had on that? Look, I, the Chancellor, I endorse what the Chancellor said was the issue needs to be resolved I know he's met recently with the FCA and they've agreed to deliver better deals for savers by driving competition and increasing reporting which I think they're doing in the next few weeks uh, in particular to make sure that savers are benefiting from higher interest rates. Um, so I fully support the FCA's review and the, indeed the new consumer duty gives them a stronger power to take action if necessary. And alongside that, the charter for mortgage holders provides support and relief for mortgage holders that are facing difficulty with repayments, allowing them to either stretch the term of their mortgages or switch to interest only payments. Either or both of those can save people hundreds of pounds a month potentially uh, on their mortgage bill uh, when it reprices uh, but also they can do that without any impact on their credit rating and there is also the support for mortgage interest scheme for more vulnerable borrowers um, which has been uh, increased in generosity and accessibility so those are the different things that, thank you uh, are moving on clive, clive betts for department for the housing and communities and leveling up committee yeah good afternoon prime minister uh, I'm sure we can all agree that uh, there's a real problem in this country, both the rising housing costs and a shortage of housing, which affects the whole country, but some families in particular. And therefore, it is important that the government achieves its target of building 300,000 new homes a year. I presume that is still the government's target. But in, at the end of the year, you consulted on, through planning policy, uh, of abolishing uh, local housing targets that councils have to meet. So when you get back to the office and get out your spreadsheets and you look at the 300,000 target at the bottom, which the nation has to hit, how can that be done if the government's going to give up its influence over the individual targets in each local area that are supposed to add up to that 300,000? Well, what I, what I would say is we had a commitment to deliver a, a million homes over the parliament, which we're continuing to make progress towards. I think in the last year that we have numbers for ending uh, 2022, something like 230,000 additional homes were delivered, which in and of itself was the third highest yearly rate, I think, in the last three decades. Um, and indeed, if you look at the last few years, all of them have been in some of the highest rates we've seen for decades. So I think that shows that the government's policies are, are delivering and we're making progress to our overall ambition of a million homes over the parliament. Um, and, and with regard to the planning reforms, I think it's important that the planning system you know, also has the confidence in communities. And planning targets remain there, but they're a starting point as opposed to something that's being imposed on communities without reference but, but to the, the particular But how is the government going to achieve the 300,000 Prime Minister if you're losing control of the individual figures that add up to it? I mean, Litchfield's the planning consultancy have said that the, 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 this planning policy in consultation 
is going to reduce house building to 150,000 a year, half the government's target. Already this year, housing stocks have fallen by 12% from the figure that was well below the 300,000 to begin with. That, that's not success, is it? Well, I think what is success is, as I said, we've delivered some of the highest years of new, homing, uh, new housing additions in three decades over the last few years. Um, so I think that shows the approach is, is working. Uh, and what we are doing as well is ensuring that we support local communities to bring housing uh, on stream, particularly on brownfield land, where we're investing That's very taxpayer good. funds are you, are you, to help remediate land and unlock Are you effectively you know, thousands giving of local homes. communities a veto then over achieving the 300,000? No, no, it's, it's, as I said, what we're doing is we, we are reforming how the planning system works so that we strengthen the neighbourhood plans, which actually, particularly neighbourhood plans have shown that they can deliver the housing that people need in their local areas, um, but they do so in a way that has the consent of the community, which is important. Uh, and it means that local the character of local areas and the particular right. circumstances in each local area, whether it's Greenbelt or something else, are taken into account in assessing well, what is a I'm reasonable amount of housing to do. sure how, how that's going to get us to 70,000 more homes when you're taking away the ability to influence targets. Can I just go on to one other point, Prime Minister? Um, many people, because they can't afford a home, there's no social housing to rent, end up in the private rented sector. Sometimes for a choice, often uh, because that's the only place for them to go. Uh, it, it, since 2020, the local housing allowance, which helps the poorest families pay for the rent in the private rented sector, has been frozen. Yet at the same time, rents in the private rented sector have risen by 25%. There's now only one in 20 homes that are covered by the local housing allowance. How is it fair for government policy to impact so severely on the poorest families who no longer can pay for the rent uh, of most homes in the private rented sector with the allowances that are available to them? So, look, I, I can't remember precisely, but I think we increased the local housing allowance a couple of years ago by very significant amount. I thought frozen since 2020, pounds. Yeah, which, but it was it frozen at a level that was significantly higher than it was before, where it was about a £600 pound uplift to, from memory, about a million and a half It doesn't households. help families with a 25% rent increase, they yeah. can't pay for it. So, uh, and actually there's the discretionary housing payments of a few hundred million pounds that are there to support people as well, as on top of, uh, on top of housing benefit. And the Affordable Homes Programme has delivered thousands of new affordable homes for rent and will continue and will continue to do but, so. But as affordable well. homes are eighty percent of market rents, Prime Minister. They're not affordable to most people, are they, on the lowest income? I look at it, it's a question of how you're targeting that support. But as I said, the, the, uh, the Affordable Homes Programme, I think it's over a £11 billion pounds over its period. It's significantly higher than the one that it replaced. It's supporting thousands of new affordable homes for rent, uh, together with housing benefit, discretionary housing payments, um, you know, all that support is that. But, but even public service workers, uh, nurses, policemen and others can't afford affordable rents in London, can they? 80% of market rents are just not within the remit of many public service workers struggling on their current levels of pay. Yes, which is why on the other side we've taken huge steps to help people with their energy bills, which is saving them around £1,500 um, over the past few months, uh, raising the national living wage by record levels to put more money in their pockets, raising the threshold at which people start paying national insurance. You know, all of those things also put more money in people's pockets. I think a lot of people will think, Prime you're not really on their side. Order. Well, I think if you actually look at typical, you can look at the case studies of families in different circumstances, and what you'll see is because of the support we've put in place, it is actually disproportionately benefiting benefiting the most vulnerable families. Now that's happening in lots of different ways, whether it's support with energy bills, the cost of living payments that are worth £900 that are going to uh, several million of the most vulnerable households in our society this year, whether it's a national living wage increase or the tax changes, all of those add up to quite meaningful support for families, deliberately targeted on the most vulnerable families. Moving on, Catherine McKennell for the Petitions Committee. Thank you. Um, but it's not working, is it, Prime Minister? Do you take responsibility for the fact the UK has the highest inflation in the G7 and the lowest growth project projections? So I think we've, we've had this debate in, in the past, and if you look at the growth projections, actually we were the fastest growing country in the G7 I, I asked a very specific, question. No, I asked a very specific question, which is, do you take responsibility well, for of, it? Of course, of, course, of course I take responsibility for the government, but I think, just to correct what you're saying, I think it's important, as, as actually the head no, of the IMF... No, sorry, do you dispute those facts? 
We have the highest um, inflation rate in the G7 and the lowest... Well, no, I'm just asking if he disputes the facts, because well, there's I'm, no I'm, point I'm, in giving I'm, a well, two-minute answer. I'm, well, I'm putting them in context, because it's important. As the head of the IMF themselves says, because those are the, 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 the numbers that you are quoting, uh, the head of the IMF themselves said at a press conference here in the UK, which I'm sure the Honourable Lady was listening to, she she's quoting the figures, that it is actually not right to focus on one specific year when it comes to growth forecasts. And actually, if you look at any period, either the two years before, where we were the fastest growing country okay, in the G7, well, I'll, well, I'll all the projections for the years thereafter, well, we, are not, to, we are not the lowest growing. I'll move she to asked about, then. Well, she asked about inflation, point. which I think is important. Worth bearing in mind. Sorry, if you look Prime at Minister, I've got quite a few um, questions I need to ask you, and I think it's important to focus on the reality of the people contacting us in Parliament about the realities they face. One in seven are cutting back or going without food because of a lack of money currently. That's one in four in my region of the North East. What level of food insecurity does the government assess is acceptable in this country? Of course, you don't want anybody to live in food But that's the reality. So what's the government doing uh, about it? Minister, to answer. So, uh, why don't we, uh, so let me explain the various things that we are doing to help people with the cost of living. So the first and most significant intervention is to support people with their energy bills, because that is the number one cost increase that they are facing. <coughs> that support is worth £1,500. It's about half of a typical family's energy bill, um, and it is benefiting all families up and down the country. I think the second thing is for the most vulnerable families, so the ones that the uh, lady is talking about, the several million of our most vulnerable families, they will receive direct cost of living support through the welfare system. Those payments, £900 for someone uh, who is in receipt of universal credit, additional payments for pensioners or those who are disabled. Uh, then also we're making sure that those on low incomes are benefiting. The national living wage has gone up by so, record so levels this year. why are people year. going hungry? And then particularly, well, the all the money that people are receiving can be used for whatever they deem is most important to them, including food. Um, but the cost of living payments that are going to people can be spent on food. So I think that does help well, people. What, what and then happens? very specifically on, on food, you know, what have we done is extend the holiday activity and food programme that's funded hundreds of millions of pounds a year. That provides not just food, but also activities to disadvantaged children outside of term time. We have healthy start vouchers for uh, expectant, pregnant um, or new mums uh, that also helps. And of course, the free schools meal programme is there. So I think if you put all of that together, whilst I accept, of course, things are challenging, there are a range of different measures in place to help people with the cost of living, deliberately and specifically targeted on the most vulnerable in our society. In terms of mortgages, Millions are currently terrified about what's going to happen with their mortgage as it comes up for review and have been ever since the disastrous mini budget last year of uh, Trust and uh, Quartain. Do you know the number of people that are due to remortgage by the end of 2024? Uh, I don't have those numbers to hand, but what I can do and what would probably be helpful is to explain to all the people that you're talking about who you said are uh, anxious about that what the support what support is in place to help them so a typical mortgage outstanding in the country is about 140,000 pounds or about 17 or so years left uh, if that mortgage was to reprice now um, that it would go up from around 770 pounds 800 pounds up to about a thousand that's a significant increase of course it is um, so what can someone do in that situation well if they extend the term of their mortgage which they can now do thanks to our mortgage charter by say 10 years that will reduce the monthly payments basically back down to where they are currently. They could switch to an interest only period uh, for a while. That will again reduce the payment by hundreds of pounds. Um, so those are just a couple of things that they can do. So those, for those who are most vulnerable, then as I said, the support for mortgage interest scheme is there through the welfare system that provides support for people uh, much more quickly than it used to. So those are the practical examples of how someone in the circumstances that you're describing can access support that will actually ease some of the burdens for them, not make them disappear for sure, but considerably ease them. What about the 15% who are not taking part in the government scheme? There's about a million mortgage lend uh, borrowers affected. What is the government doing about that? Is I'm it really enough to say to the banks, be nice? 
Uh, no, like I said the vast majority of the mortgage market is covered, and the Chancellor is continuing to have those conversations with the uh, with the fifteen percent that are not. But the vast majority are covered, and that's why, as I've outlined, for someone on a typical mortgage, that support can potentially, or those easements, can potentially help offset hundreds of pounds on their monthly mortgage costs when they come to, to reprice, as well as the support that's there through the welfare system. Um, and again, they can do that without any impact on their credit rating and because of the consumer duty that um, the Chancellor has uh, introduced with the FCA, uh, anyone facing fear of repossession will have a full 12 months before that can happen and the banks have a duty to to act fairly and responsibly. So as I said, I, of course I know it's a worrying time, but there are very specific practical steps that are in place to help people. Thank you. And moving on to William Ragg on constitutional matters for the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee. Um, thank you, Sir Bernard, and good afternoon, Prime Minister. Prime Minister, I hear alarming reports of a blob wandering down Whitehall, thwarting the ambitions of ministers. Um, do you recognise that characterisation? Uh, no. And um, so where do you think it comes from? I, 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 it doesn't come from me that my general you know, my general experience has been in the, the jobs I've had, whether it's starting out at uh, MHCLG, where I spent much time uh, with Clive, um, but also in particular at the Treasury over the last few years and now in number 10, yeah. that I've always been supported by incredibly hardworking and diligent civil servants who responded to what I needed and worked all hours, day and night, to deliver what I wanted. So, so some current and former ministers, however short-lived they might have been, the one night of the realm is described as blobonomics. Do you think this, this talk is really an excuse for weak ministers and perhaps unworkable policies? I, I think ultimately the elected government of the day is responsible for the policies uh, that it is putting forward. And you know, I would expect and indeed have found in my experience the civil service to be responsive to implementing them. Um, of course, that, that requires strong leadership and direction from, from ministers in grip over what's happening. Um, and of course, you know, things may sometimes feel harder to, to work through than you would like them to. But as I said, in my personal experience, I haven't found that to be uh, an issue. And so with, you, with your experience, which I accept entirely, do you sometimes take those struggling ministers to one side and perhaps put a friendly arm around their shoulder and perhaps <laughs> try to inculcate that, uh, that sense of work ethic in them? I think look, everyone is. I think everyone is working very hard to deliver for the country, uh, elected uh, and appointed ministers, and also the civil service that uh, works for them. Of course, the last few years have not been easy for anybody, given all the various challenges, pandemic, war in Ukraine, and that the demands that that's put on the entire system. Um, but I think everyone uh, remains committed to delivering, and I think is, I would expect them all to work very hard to do so. So, so reports of relations between the government and civil service being at an all-time low are somewhat exaggerated? Uh, certainly from my perspective, and that's not conducive to delivering for the country, if uh, indeed they were to be that, right? That my, my view, and has always been that I've been very fortunate to be served by absolutely brilliant civil servants who have given me everything I've always asked of them, and more at all hours of the day. I've been very fortunate and grateful to them for that support. Uh, I continue to find that in my current job, and I have no reason to expect that uh, to change. Or, and my general view is that you know, their, their, their job is to support government to do it, and we should do that in a constructive attitude, and that's what I'd like to see and expect to happen. Thank you. Just come on to matters to do with House of Lords appointments, if I may. Could you just briefly explain what you understand to be the conventions around resignation honours, and in particular the nomination of new peers? So my understanding is that previous prime ministers are entitled to, to resignation honours. They would go through the normal vetting process. Uh, I followed what I uh, understand and believe to be the long-standing convention of forwarding those names um, to the palace for clearance after they have been through the vetting process. Um, and without any active involvement, engagement or interference in that process. Uh, and so you, you know, um, conducted your, your constitutional role entirely proprietously? Uh, yes, uh, as I said, I had no active involvement or engagement in that process. I received a list and forwarded it on unaltered. The, the, the list that came having been vetted by the House of Lords Appointments Commission? Absolutely. And I think there's only one example in the past of that not being the case, is that right? Uh, not, not with yourself as Prime Minister. I'm not familiar with that example, but... Well, I think the example is Lord Crudders, 
and the next day you gave the party a donation, but they're entirely unrelated, I'm quite as, sure. I said, I've, uh, I've, whatever list that I've received that has been through the vetting process, I've forwarded on without interference uh, or active involvement in it. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, could I ask if you think there's any circumstances under which a resignation honours list is not appropriate? I said, look, it's a long-standing convention that's uh, been adhered to by, I think, parties of, uh, on both sides of the House, and I've fulfilled what I believe to be my constitutional uh, role in following convention in forwarding on a list that I received that had been vetted uh, for approval without interfering and, uh, and opining on it. And that has generally been the case for political honours more broadly. Uh, you know, they're forwarded without the person in charge necessarily agreeing with political honours more generally. And that's how the system has, has worked. May I ask if you're still reviewing the former Prime Minister Liz Truss's list? I said I, that process is ongoing and it hasn't reached me yet. It hasn't reached you yet. That, that, that's helpful. This is, this is entirely hypothetical, as you understand, from my keenness for a Conservative victory at the next general election. So please don't take this the wrong <laughs> way. But if the eventuality was that you, uh, in circumstances, would you think it appropriate yourself to issue a resignation on this list? Okay, it's not something I'm focused on or have given any thought to. <laughs> I, think that, I think that's a fairly good answer. <laughs> Thank you, Sir Bernard. Right, right. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Uh, Pete Wishart, Scottish Affairs. Prime Minister, it's now almost 25 years since the Scotland Act established the Scottish Parliament, and I think it would be fair to say that relationships between the two governments have never been so poor, characterised as they are by mistrust, suspicion and antagonism. What are you personally doing to try and improve the situation? Well, I think it's important to try and have a constructive relationship with uh, all the devolved governments in the United doing? Kingdom. Um, clearly, we're not going to agree on everything, but that doing? doesn't mean. Uh, well, I, I'm sorry, I'm just, I, th I do think it's important, uh, which is why I think when I first had this job, I spoke, I think, on the first day to the, as it was then, First Minister, not just of Scotland, but of Wales. I was also the first Prime Minister, I think, in over a decade to attend the British Irish Council that brought together. Uh, the leaders from across the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. That was warmly received. I met with the First Ministers in my role and, and have done with the new First Minister and continue to try and find ways to work collaboratively together for Freeports being a, a good example of that, whilst acknowledging with, it, it's clearly not that we're going to agree on everything, but it's good to have the dialogue. Well, that's a, a very lengthy and important list, but this is the case that we now have a situation where the UK routinely ignores Scottish Parliament legislative consent motions. The UK can now legislate in devolved areas. You know, the nuclear option of a Section 35 being used for the first time. And Scottish government ministers are even being reprimanded for saying Brexit is bad for Scotland when meeting foreign delegations. Do you think this muscular unionism is actually working for you? No, as I said, I, I think there are examples of the Scottish government and UK government working together, particularly to deliver things like free ports. Um, but you mentioned the Section 35. I think we've had that debate in the past. It was clear um, that there were concerns about the operation of uh, that law on UK-wide um, UK -wide competencies and areas of competence. Uh, and it was reasonable in that sense for the Scottish Secretary of State, after taking the significant legal advice uh, to issue the Section 35, and, and you say, I, I, I know, that, yes, the first time it's been used, but it was always it's envisaged, it was used. always envisaged that it might be used, uh, including, I think, by the SNP at the time. It's not, it's um, so I don't think people can debate the principle of being used because it was something that was supported at the time. Uh, and again, obviously, it's yeah. subject to a legal proceeding now, so there's a limit not, to how much we can say. The Scottish government, but with respect, the Welsh Labour government recently criticised the UK government's unilateral and destructive approach to devolution and is actually seeking to have the UK more judicially reviewed. The Northern Irish executive isn't sitting in Scotland. Wales feels that their democracy is under real threat. Is devolution broken? Uh, well, again, um, on, on Wales, I spoke to the First Minister, and I think the first day I got this job, I spent time, I met with him, again, delivering free ports, which are a good example of uh, Wales, and Scot uh, Wales and the UK government working together. And with regard to Northern Ireland, because you, you brought it up, I think, actually, I don't think anyone can say that I haven't been heavily actively involved in trying to restore the executive in Northern Ireland. I think I visited Northern Ireland almost 
five or six times in my first uh, few months uh, in in this job, um, uh, I think it should demonstrate my commitment to Northern Ireland, the people of Northern Ireland. And the Windsor framework represents, I think, a very significant intervention uh, that re removed one of the big barriers to the executive being restored in Northern given Ireland. Given that the UK government's given itself the provisions of the Single Market Act against strong opposition from Scotland and Wales, isn't it the main problem that the UK government represents English interests while at the same time being the arbiter? and referee for the whole of the United Kingdom. And you've now given yourself the powers of the European Union. Surely the four nations idea across the UK just isn't working anymore. No, I think actually, look, the, the Scottish government, as far as I can recall when I last looked at this, was probably the most powerful devolved assembly anywhere in the world. If not, one, if not the, certainly one of, uh, government also delivered all the recommendations in the uh, after 2016. Those have all been uh, delivered. And I think the UK government is right that it looks after UK-wide interests. Now, as I say, some, sometimes those will conflict, and we've seen that with the Section 35 on the Gender Recognition, Gender Recognition Act. Uh, there's a court process to resolve that, so you we should let that run. Let that saving run, Scotland from itself with legislation like uh, No, reform, I think that's because like there's... The DR, DRS is at your job now to be the corrective feature when it comes to demonstrations no. that you don't like. No, actually, I mean, the DRS, actually, the drinks industry raised concerns about so the Scottish you, government's your job return to do that on their behalf. differing on the rest of the plans for the UK. Now, it's because they had an interaction with UK interests that the UK government uh, ha was requested for the UKIM exclusion. Uh, and actually, as I said, there was an exclusion given on, on narrow terms, and uh, the decision to the decision to not proceed was a decision that was made by the Scottish Government. So there was seen right. to be in the English national interest, therefore, it will be judged to be in the UK interest. Is that how it no. works? I'm, I'm just trying to understand so. how we, we get to where we are with these, these... If it's four nations, surely all four nations should be equal in how these issues are approached. Well, I, as I said, the, the operation of the scheme had an impact on UK-wide uh, interests, and that's why UKIM exclusion was sought, uh, granted on a, a narrow... Uh, basis, which would allow the scheme to proceed in a particular way. It was a decision, I think, of the Scottish Government, ultimately, not to proceed with it. Yeah, because um, you made it possible for them. Uh, that's, that's not right, actually. I think the Chief Executive of Circularity Scotland was categorical. Nothing to do with you. I think it was categorical that the scheme remain viable uh, mm -hmm. on that basis, and many successful schemes uh, run without glass. So I, I, it was the Scottish Government that decided not to proceed, that's just uh, and that's a decision that you know, they, they can explain. Sir Chris Bryant for the Standards Committee. Thank you. Um, the Ministerial Code says, when Parliament is in session, the most important announcements of government policy should be made in the first instance in Parliament. So why did you announce the NHS workforce plan, not in Parliament, but outside Parliament? Uh, I I've always tried to announce what I can in Parliament. I think my track record and the Speaker has always said in the past that I particularly uh, uh, have done that. Um, where, where that's not possible, or it's, the statement is made immediately there afterwards, uh, uh, particularly in areas. the last Friday. Uh, I think particularly where it's worth considering that this is not just the government's plan; it's also the NHS's. You could plan. have announced it in Parliament on Monday, couldn't you? Uh, well, I, as I said, this you involved not, not just to. the government; it involved also uh, the NHS. Well, because it was Mr. the NHS's long-term workforce plan. Uh, the government was pleased to support it and proud to support it, and oh, it's come a plan it. that will do something come off uh, special it, for, for the NHS in this 75th year. The Speaker said yesterday, the Prime Minister is a Member of Parliament. He is answerable to the Members of Parliament from all political parties. I have to say that his behaviour was not acceptable. He may be the Prime Minister, but the Members of Parliament should hear first. Have you apologised to the House yet? Uh, as, as I said, I, I continue to be in Parliament to answer members' questions on a range of issues, making statements on a range of topics, and will continue to do so. But you're not coming to Prime Minister's questions tomorrow, are you, or next week? Uh, yes, because I am uh, attending the 75th anniversary celebration for the NHS. And you decided yeah. when that should be, so you could have had uh, it tomorrow no, evening or uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, no, again, that's not right. I did not decide uh, when that was, uh, and, and quite frankly, even if it was on a different day, uh, also because His Majesty is in Scotland on Wednesday, it might have been reasonable for me to be there as well. And with regard to the week afterwards, I'm also at the NATO summit. The Remind us the, when a Prime Minister I, do, I, may, may, I don't know whether is the Honourable Gentleman suggesting that I shouldn't attend the NATO summit on behalf of the United Kingdom as previous Prime Ministers have done. Remind us when a Prime Minister last missed two Prime Ministers' questions in a row. 
uh, as I said, I, 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 I don't know, but yeah. as I said, I'm... Well, I don't know, it's, it's important. Is the Honourable Gentleman suggesting that I, I don't attend the NATO summit, which I'm not in control of the dates of? No, I'm suggesting that you should be attending Prime Minister's questions and... Um, and not you attending have, the NATO and summit. Made, and you should have made the statement to the House of Commons because your own ministerial code says that that's what you should do. So you, your view is so that... You didn't, no, your view is that we should not be attending the... NHS celebration or the King's uh, coronation celebration in Scotland or indeed the NATO summit. I mean, that, that's a perfectly okay. reasonable point of view. L but let me ask said, you a different question. Pointing you out didn't, the leader of the opposition okay. also will be speaking We're talking about your at turning the, up uh, in NHS. Parliament. We're talking, uh, about, NHS, your, uh, we're talking about your respect for Parliament. You didn't turn up for the Owen Paterson uh, votes at all. That's right, isn't it? Uh, I, I can't recall. You didn't turn up for the Boris Johnson um, votes at all, did you? Uh, so no, I was at a, a charity dinner for Jewish care. <laughs> I think that's uh, some cutting it fine, I would argue, since um, other members of Parliament who were at the same dinner with you and left after you did manage to get back for the vote. Uh, I think, I, with greatest respect, I think their role and my role at the dinner probably slightly different. You chose not to be there, didn't you? Uh, that's that's uh, twice. Chose, on two rule-breaking moments, you chose uh, not to be in Parliament. But uh, yesterday, you were pined on the rules of cricket. Uh, I, Take I, us I, through that. Uh, I... I chose to fulfil my obligation to an incredible charity for whom that is one of their significant fundraising moments of the year. Uh, my presence there was something that they had asked for and actually me being there and being able to thank their volunteers okay. and donors was something that they appreciated. Others were and there. Uh, Wes Streeting was there as well. He managed uh, to get uh, back again, to Again, with, with the greatest respect, I, I think his role and my role at that dinner were probably slightly different. Uh, and okay. I'm, I'm very happy to Fine. talk All about right. the rules of cricket, as you, as you mentioned. Yeah, uh, but not awesome. about rule-breaking in Parliament. No, so no, I've, I've, that's also, my point. I've, all, I've also addressed that too. And if I might ask you too. about the Privileges Committee then. So the Privileges Committee has accused seven MPs of trying to undermine and impugn its work. The Leader of the House has condemned this. Do you think that they should apologise to the House? Uh, I haven't actually gone through the report yet. So You haven't read the report? Uh, no, I haven't been through the report yet in detail. I've seen it being reported and I've been very clear in the past that... But you asked Zach Goldsmith to apologise? Yes, because he's a So minister. you have read it sufficiently to note that Zach Goldsmith should apologise? Yes, I've read the findings report. I haven't read the report from cover to cover, no. But it's I have read the findings. It's about three pages long. Right, but I've seen but the you've findings. Read, you, you know that Zach Goldsmith ought to apologise, but you haven't got an opinion about whether the other seven Ah, because apologize. there's a difference between Zach Goldsmith's role as a minister, uh, and I think that wasn't consistent with him being a minister, yes. Ah, so you have read the report? Uh, I, I have not read the, every page of the report. Okay. Sorry, which, are you talking about which reports? Sorry, anyway. There are two reports. The report that we're considering next week, the one in which it says that the, the committee thinks that the seven members of Parliament, all of your political party, were seeking to in, impugn and undermine the committee report. Let me ask you something else. You have to authorise um, all foreign travel by trade envoys and other parliamentarians and par parliamentary private secretaries. In the last year, that's cost £264,192. Why won't you publish the details of who that's being spent on? Uh, it, it's not something I'm familiar with the details of past practice on that, but I'll happily look into it. OK, different question. Um, do you think UK businesses should still be trading in Russia at all? Uh, I think UK businesses should be following all the sanctions legislation that we've put and put in place. Do you think they should be trading in Russia at all, a year after the second invasion? Yeah, there, there may be particular circumstances in which some businesses are in the process of either divesting or where it's considered that it would actually be uh, detrimental to our interests or hand over assets very so, cheaply for the Russians. Uh, but as I said, the job of businesses okay. is to comply with the laws that we set. So um, Mantrak, Mantrak, which owns Unitrack FZE, sold new diggers to Russia in April of this year, and you took £5 million from its owner. Is that right? I said, Last I'm, question. I'm not familiar with okay. the specific company. Um, Philip Dunn, Environmental Audit Committee. Uh, last time we met at this committee, uh, Prime Minister, you were very keen to pay tribute to the leadership role of the UK on climate and nature issues, and you particularly singled out Lord Goldsmith for his role in delivering the biodiversity deal in Montreal. Are you still as proud of UK leadership on climate and nature in view of Lord Goldsmith's remarks in his resignation letter last week? Yes. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I said I'm grateful to him for the work that he did, which helped contribute uh, to that role. But uh, as I said, we should be very proud of our leadership role on cl tackling climate change, but also putting nature at the heart of how we do so. 
So the, the ambition for net zero remains, but delivery over the past uh, year and under your prime ministership has slowed. And the evidence for that is the uh, client, Committee on Climate Change's report last week, in which Lord Deben said in his uh, his finale, to, in his forward to that annual report, uh, that our confidence in achieving the UK's 2030 target of the fifth and sixth carbon budgets has markedly declined from last year through lack of apparent delivery by officials, um, taking a signal that this has not been your priority as Prime Minister. I, say, look, I disagree with, what, with uh, what Zach Goldsmith said. I think our record is and that second was Lord to none. Yes, no, but just go more broadly, our record on this. And I mean, the facts are that we've decarbonised faster than any other G7 country. Right. Those, those are the facts. Uh, you know, the facts are that when we were presidents of COP, we ensured a, a very successful COP that had a clear trajectory to 1.5, made sure that we increased the number of countries that had uh, binding targets on net zero. Um, we've protected land degradation, forests, coal financing. There's a range of things that we have led on. And with regard to the carbon budget, I, again, the facts are that we have overachieved on every single one of our carbon budgets to date. Uh, we are on track to have met the third, that's what the latest statistics show. And I think the Committee for Climate Change said that their confidence in the UK meeting the fourth carbon budget has actually slightly increased in the last year. Look, with regard to you know, 2033, then 2037, which is when some of these future carbon budgets are, um, of course, We've already set out that some of those policies will evolve over time. It's hard to predict right now with certainty the exact shape of the UK economy in 2037. But we've done a better job of this than anybody else. We have the most ambitious targets compared to anybody else. So I feel nothing but proud and confident in our record. Do you expect uh, the British government to respond to both the US and the EU significant interventions uh, that have happened this year? before the COP28 meeting in November? Sorry, Philip, what was So we've had the Inflation Reduction Act oh, in the right, United fine. States, we've had so, significant measures yeah, in the EU. I think, look, it's, it's, it's right that other places are catching up with us, right? I mean, that's the reality of it. We have decarbonised faster than any of those other blocks. So other countries are having to catch up, which is a good thing, which we welcome, right? That will help combat climate change. Um, and I'm glad that they're doing so. And we, we do this in a completely different way, historically. We've done it through things like contracts for difference and other things, which have brought tens of billions of pounds of investment into the sector. Uh, and if you look at that over time, um, and you actually compare as a percentage of GDP what we've done, what the US has done, we've consistently out-invested and will continue to do so. Um, that's, it's just that people do it in different ways. And I think you need to compare on an apples-to-apples -apples basis. Um, and again, one of the ways in which and our contracts for difference structure is now being copied all around the world um, and that is a different way to bring investment into the green transition um, but also one on the r d side we've protected our r d budget it's growing uh, that's ultimately how we can also contribute because if we can develop the technologies that will help us deal with these things um, and then commercialize them that will do enormous good for the world and that's something that plays to our strengths as a country so looking forward to COP28, do you plan to prioritise UK leadership? And if so, how are you going to do, demonstrate that? Yes. I mean, again, I attended COP as Chancellor and we had a very successful finance day. I think it was widely perceived to be the most successful finance day that COP had ever had. Uh, and the centrality of that made sure that we would be the first net zero financial centre um, and all the things around TCFD disclosures and other things which we've pioneered. That's what I did as Chancellor. I attended last year. We talked about nature in particular last year and that carried on at Montreal. Uh, and we will continue to do that this year as well. And I think part of the focus this year uh, will be on attracting private capital to help with the transition. And that's something given our strength in financial services is an area where I think we can obviously play uh, a leading role in. Thank you. Thank you. And moving on to uh, Robin Walker, Education Committee. Thanks, Mohit. Um, you've referred, Prime Minister, to education as the closest thing to a silver bullet that we have. You also said at PMQs recently that children missing school is a tragedy. So how concerned are you with the latest figures that show that 24.2% of pupils were persistently absent in the autumn term, uh, almost double the rate of the previous year? Yeah. I, I think the first thing is I'm 
you know, it's welcome that the number of pupils who are persistently absent in school fell by, you know, I think over 300,000 spring term uh, 2022 to the to year before. But you're right that persistent absence is a real challenge. Um, the tools for responding to it, resolving it, don't just lie with the Department for Education as well. Um, so you know, one of the things we're doing is rolling out attendance hubs across around 600 different primary and secondary schools um, to spread best practice. That will reach, I think, about a quarter of a million children. Um, and the work they do includes activities like automatic text messages, using data to analyse uh, proactively who might be at risk, those types of things. Um, and there's some other things I can talk to, but look, it, it's a real challenge and it's right that we focus on it. In, in terms of addressing this challenge, um, one solution which the government previously drafted legislation for was a statutory register for children not in school. That's been supported by the Children's Commissioner, the Select Committee, uh, the Opposition Front Bench, I think, and PMQs recently. Um, and, and, and it's something we have legislation before the House from um, my colleague on the committee, Flip Drummond, uh, to address that. Is that something that you feel the government could embrace and deliver? I, I think, look, we remain committed to introducing a statutory local authority register for children, uh, as well as actually a duty for local authorities to provide support to home educating families. Uh, you know, we will look to legislate at a suitable opportunity um, to do so, but obviously, again, without preempting full session legislation. That's uh, since, since we last met, you've um, the Chancellor has made very welcome announcements in terms of childcare and stepping up the activity of the government in that respect, providing support to parents of under three year olds. Um, that will mean a shift from the government subsidising about 50% of the childcare market to around 80%. Do you recognise that puts an additional burden of responsibility on, on ministers and the government to make sure it is adequately funded so that settings can keep going? Yes, just the first thing to say is that a member of my family has a financial interest in a childcare company, but uh, as well as the expansion that the, child, uh, the Chancellor announced in the provision extending the age entitlement, significant funding was put in to, de to the, uh, deal with the existing entitlement to meet inflationary pressures. It was around 200 million in uh, this year, paid from this September, and then a rising to just shy of 300 million um, for the future year with further uplifts uh, to come. Uh, what does that mean? It means a 30% increase in the two-year-old rate, um, which will take it to around eight pounds an hour, uh, but also um, uh, an inflationary increase to the other rates as well. And, and, and some of those rates, I think, uh, have been welcomed in theory by some of the practitioners we spoke to, but there is a question mark over whether they will actually receive them, given some of the um, machinery of local government through which the, the rates have to pass. Um, will you be encouraging ministers to ensure that they do uh, receive the, the rates at all close to the national rate that's been advertised? Yes. I mean, the rates were chosen in response to surveys um, with, I think, thousands of nurseries to understand the cost, different cost structure for provision. Uh, they're adjusted in local areas to account for local differences. Um, I, 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 will, I will go back and make sure that the money is flowing as it is intended to, but it has been certainly um, been announced and put aside. And just, just lastly on this area, what, uh, one of the great benefits of early education is early identification of need. Um, uh, in terms of SEND, um, picking up issues early on, being able to address them early on, it allows children to engage with their education uh, in mainstream schools who might otherwise end up in much more expensive and more limiting uh, specialist placements. Um, however, our, our committees heard that only 18% of local authorities feel they have enough provision for disabled children in the early years. Uh, is there anything specific that you think should be done to address that as part of the wider efforts of the government in SEND? I'd say the, the Send and Alternative Provision Improvement Plan that we published in uh, March, I think, of this year, um, just sets out the government's mission for Send and Alternative Provision, uh, making sure that it can fulfil, uh, or we can collectively fulfil children's potential and have trust of parents in the system and financial sustainability. And alongside that, we're increasing the high needs funding by about £10 billion um, for this financial year, which is... 10% increase over last year's funding, so you know that should help. And uh, moving further up the school system, there's been a lot of concern about transparency uh, on schools teaching of RSHE materials, and uh, you, how do you strike the right balance between reassuring parents and making sure that they can have access to these materials and making sure that children do have access to the curriculum that the Conservative government introduced? Yeah, look, my personal view is it's it's 
it's vital that what children are taught in RSHE is age appropriate and factual. Uh, you know, I was concerned by reports that that wasn't the case, as was the Education Secretary. That's why we brought forward a review of the RHSE statutory guidance. We've assembled an expert independent panel um, who are drawing on different backgrounds, health, education, equalities, children development, safeguarding, um, to help inform our work. Uh, you know, that work should, their work should conclude um, in September and, and their recommendations will form a will help us uh, form a public consultation uh, for later in the autumn. Um, uh, so that, that's our approach to that. Uh, with regard to materials for parents, I think we've been very clear, you know, parents should be able to see all resources and I don't think... And ministers have repeatedly stated from the dispatch box that parents should be able to see. I think courts have ruled otherwise. If, if, if there is a, a legal issue here, w would legislation be a possibility to address it? I said uh, we're working through that as we speak, but our, our general view is that copyright law does not prevent a parent from viewing external resources. Um, we've written to schools to clarify our expectations, but as I said, we, that's, you know, the review and the guidance will, will work through that particular issue, but our current position is that copyright law shouldn't uh, prohibit that from happening. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, and finally, Steve Bryan for the Health and Social Care Committee. Thank you, Chair. Prime Minister, well done. Well done on uh, getting the NHS long-term workforce plan out. It's a, it's a serious piece of work and uh, it's a big moment. And, and well done for taking the long view because you know, clearly a 15-year plan um, out, outlives even the next parliament when you're prime minister. Um, can I ask you about medical school training places? It says in the plan that the first new medical school places will be available from September 25. Now, presumably that's about the, the public expenditure cycle. But we've heard from colleagues and medical schools who are in a position now to make offers for September 24 to domestic students who want to be doctors in, in England. Um, if there were funded places available now, the UCAS deadline for September next year is the 15th of October this year. Is there a reason why we're kicking in in September 25? Uh, well, it's, it's not just the medical training places. My understanding of it is we need to make sure that the pipeline can also deal with the other training that people will need, not just in the medical schools, and the system needs to be able to deliver that at the same time. Uh, but also, as one of the things we talked about is uh, we're looking at the medical school training itself and looking at whether there are ways to improve the efficiency and streamline that process. And uh, we want to make sure we do that work. Uh, because if there's a way to fund medical school training places that are done in a, a more efficient or effective way, we'd like to do that. Um, so that, is, that work needs to happen as well. And I think that will take some time, because that will obviously involve the medical regulators to look at potential different ways of training students and making sure that they're okay with it if we can do the training in a slightly shorter period of time whilst obviously maintaining the quality right. that would be beneficial uh, and if we want to put incremental funding into that uh, ideally so we need time for that process to play out there's a lot of announcements in the plan i mean i think you could have filled your number 10 grid for for many many weeks hence with the number of things that are in here one of which was talking about, with respect to training dentists, a tie-in period to encourage dentists to spend a minimum, minimum proportion of their time delivering NHS care in the years following graduation. Could you tell us how long that could potentially be in your mind, and was that discussed in political circles for doctors more widely? Yeah, I think I, I addressed this at the, the press conference. It, um, I think people have raised concerns, both on the medical side and the dentistry side, uh, the work was done on the medical side, and I think I said that I haven't got the numbers to hand, but I think around 95-ish percent um, of people who had done medical training after a certain period of time were still in NHS practice. So the issue was, I think, far less widespread than most people assumed it to be, which was why it didn't seem like right now it was necessary. Um, the, the issue on dentistry was more pervasive, where I think, as I said, I don't have it to hand, but around, I think, only two-thirds of those who had trained at some point later were doing NHS, providing NHS services. That's obviously a far more significant issue, um, and that's after the receipt of hundreds of thousands of pounds of taxpayer support during training, so it did seem reasonable to explore options for a tie 
there. Um, but as I said, no conclusions, but that seems to be something that is worth exploring for dentistry. But at this stage, the issue in, in medicine seems to be less pervasive than so imagined. Just, just sticking briefly with teeth, because you'll know there's huge concern among our constituents about access to NHS dentistry. Um, there is talk to the, of a NHS dentistry plan from the department, um, presuming that you wanted to get the workforce plan out first. Could you give any update to constituents as to when they might see that? I, you know, I don't have a, an update, uh, but I can tell you that we're still getting on and there's more money that's been put into dentistry, uh, there's been ref some reform and changes to the existing dentistry contract and high performing uh, practices are able to provide I think about 10% more activity um, which should also help and the number of dentists higher now than it was uh, before um, or in the last set of numbers that I've seen. And, uh, mm. But not necessarily doing NHS work, of course, that's the challenge. Sorry? Not necessarily doing NHS work. But I said that, that's why the workforce plan not mm. only trains more dentists, okay. uh, but also is exploring the type. All right. But the reforms to the contract should hopefully increase NHS dentistry activity. Just finally, activity. The, the plan says on, on page 13, rising demographic pressures uh, and changing burden of disease are increasing demand for NHS services. Well, yeah, and some. I mean, demand continues to outstrip supply with an ageing population. Um, and I just wonder, where are you on the prevention agenda, Prime Minister? Because it has to be better than cure. You know, when you see that we've kicked the buy one, get one free regulations down the line, the advertising restrictions for food, high fat, salt, sugar, that's been pushed down the line. Where are you personally on the prevention of ill health? No, of course prevention is always better than, uh, better than a cure. I think it's, it's worth being cognizant of the particular challenges with inflation and the cost of living that we face at the moment and I think that's it's reasonable to uh, course correct for, for that but more generally you can see what calorie labelling on menus for example uh, is a good example of that and then if you look at the provision most recently of anti-obesity medicines uh, that should that should help um, because we know there's a link there between other conditions like heart disease and diabetes um, uh, but then also uh, on smoking where the switch to stop program again is trying to to act proactively and I think quite innovatively and the chief medical officer who's here would be able to talk to you about it better than I can um, but there's such persuasive evidence that that program of the schemes that we've done on a smaller scale if you can help people switch away from smoking to using vapes this is not disposable vapes for children which is obviously concerning and I've spoken about that in the past but for existing adult smokers to switch um, there are clear public health benefits of that before bigger problems um, come down the line. So look, those are some examples of the things we're doing in the prevention thank space. You. And thank you for getting the plan out. Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, well, we've done extremely well and we're going to finish it even a little early, partly because I've foregone my own questions to a large extent. But could I just ask Sir Chris Bryant, who has volunteered to correct the record very nicely? Yes, uh, many apologies. I said that West Streeting had voted on the 19th of June and I was wrong. So I just want to put the record straight. Apologies to the committee. Thank you very much indeed. Prime Minister, thank you for your attendance today. Maybe we can have an extra 10 minutes or so next time. But um, I'm most grateful to you for attending. Thank you very much. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.
The proceeding has ended.